Hello, everyone. This is Mike Miller. Uh, I'm actually not at the East Bank or West Bank of the Flats in downtown Cleveland at the Muse Bank. We're doing something really unusual, and uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, I hope a lot of you who tuned in today uh, are familiar with our Cleveland Stories series. It's something we've been doing for about five years, where we tell some uh, stories about Cleveland history. And almost a year ago, we uh, added once a month uh, a film cafe series uh, where we uh, partnered with the uh, Cleveland Film Commission uh, to uh, kind of bring together the film community once a month as part of our Cleveland Stories series. So uh, one of the things I always like to do is thank some of the partners that help us bring it, bring this series to you. On the uh, film cafe side, uh, not only do we have uh, Cleveland Film Commission as partners, we also have the Cleveland State Film School. And again, these folks help us put in touch with a lot of the local filmmakers and uh, that community. And it's just been a great and we've been having a lot of fun with it. Uh, but on the Cleveland Story side, we have the Cleveland History Center. Uh, the Cleveland History Center is part of the Western Reserve Historical Society. Society has been around in Cleveland for almost over a hundred years. Uh, they renamed a couple of the great museums they have in University Circle, the Cleveland History Center a few years ago, and it, they're just great folks too, connecting us to some of the uh, great uh, storytellers about Cleveland history. So, uh, you know, very excited about uh, doing this virtually tonight. Uh, we had over 300 people uh, accept our invitation, so hopefully uh, we start seeing a good number of you uh, here tonight. Um, now, uh, as we get along here, guys, we're, we'll be putting up a screen in a little bit to explain how you can ask some questions. Uh, but usually we do uh, uh, at the club. Uh, first of all, is I hope all of you have a beer. I'm definitely going to be having a beer. That's what I do on the stage at the club, because uh, these are very casual. Uh, but I'm going to be talking tonight. Oh, see, Evan has a beer. Uh, I'm going to be talking tonight to uh, the new president of the Cleveland Film Commission, uh, Evan Miller. He's actually a distant cousin. I'm going to explain that later in the programming here. Um, but... Uh, We'll also uh, be telling a little bit about how to ask them questions, but we're gonna kick off like we would normally do on the music box uh, uh, with me doing some interviewing with Evan. So you ready, Evan? Let's do it. Thank uh, you for having me. Now, I always kind of surprise uh, uh, storytellers because I heard uh, several times tonight from Juliana that uh, you know I'd be introducing you. I actually don't do that. You do that. So. Evan, uh, let's uh, hear your story. Uh, where were you born? Where'd you grow up? And where'd you go to school? Okay. So again, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Music Box, everyone helping put this together in these kind of weird times. This was a great way for us to kind of get back out. So really appreciate you guys. So I grew up in the east side suburbs, uh, was born and uh, lived in Mayfield, and then uh, grew up in Orange Village. Uh, from there, went to Ohio State. And honestly, film TV was the last thing on my mind. I was uh, went in pre-med, and clearly I'm a doctor now, so that, that worked out as I planned. Um, and actually even went to a year of law school after I got my business degree, thinking I really wanted to get into sports agenting. Sports, entertainment have always been my passions. And loved what I was learning, did not like being in class. And everything I had learned about uh, from friends in the entertainment business, they had it was learned by doing. It was going to be bad money. It was going to be long hours and work that we had worked much harder than what we were going to be doing, you know, stuffing envelopes, but you did it if you wanted to work your way up. And at the time I needed a change in life and had not, you know, had a dog and I looked at her and said, let's do this. Uh, moved out with actually uh, lived with another Orange High School alum who works for uh, Jet Propulsion Labs out there. And he had an empty room in Pasadena and I started in the mailroom at a talent agency. All right. Now you're, you're moving pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to jump back. Uh, did after uh, a year, you said you uh, went to law school for a year. Uh, 
did you end up doing any uh, employment back here or did you just decide, okay, I'm quitting school, I'm getting in a car with my dog and I'm driving to uh, uh, California? Pretty much. I mean, at that point, it really was still outside of my purview to think about living outside of Ohio. I'm born and raised here. My whole family's here. Um, and, you know, the furthest I'd moved away was Columbus to be at Ohio State. So, um, but again, you know, it was one of those moments where I just, um, you know, the stars kind of aligned. My mantra at the time was no wife, no kids, no mortgage. I had nothing tying me down. And I needed to take a shot. And, um, you know, thankfully, my family, my friends, everyone couldn't have been more supportive. And just knowing if, if I was ever going to do it now was the time. Um, so made the trip across country with all my stuff in a U-Haul and did it in about three days and started my job about a week later and hit the ground running. All right. Well, let's bring this real quickly full circle, though. So now you're the new president of the uh, Cleveland Film Commission, uh, replacing, you know, a pretty famous uh, uh, predecessor. I, And now we're in the middle of a pandemic. You know, how has the transition been for you coming back to Cleveland? Uh, the why did you bring the pandemic? Okay, I didn't bring it, I promise. I came from the West. It was, you know, it, it, I, I don't know if it, where it came from, but it did not, uh, as far as I know, I didn't bring it with me. But um no, so transition has been great. Um, you know, I don't think I could have relocated and, and jumped right back in and felt as much a part of a community as I could have in Cleveland. Um, you know, Did you move back to the east side? Uh, move close. My wife grew up in Brecksville, so we moved there. Uh, still close to family, great schools, and especially compared to what you can get in, in California, we were just very excited to be able to spread out a little bit. So. Um, but it, you know, Ivan left us in an amazing situation that right when I came in, we had three films working pretty concurrently, uh, in the fall. So we started off really busy and we were on pace for things to be busy this year. And then this little virus came up and, uh, and set us back a little bit, but you know, fortunately we have an amazing team an amazing board that we've, you know, have pivoted to figure out, okay, you know, while production stalled, where can we help things along? Where can we encourage people to get more information? How can we get people ultimately back to work when the time is right? All right. Outstanding. All right. So uh, again, I know I'm bouncing around a little bit, but uh, you had uh, took us through. Now, again, you're, you're, you said that in, uh, you kind of started in pre-med, you, you moved on to some law, you get in a car. And was it at that point uh, you know, on your way to California, okay, now it's the film industry, right? Or did you know what you were going to be doing once you got out to Los Angeles or the Los Angeles area? I knew I wanted to get in on the business and it was applying, you know, for agency jobs, management companies, production positions, anywhere that was going to take my resume, which at the time was tough because I had no experience and I had an area code that wasn't Los Angeles. You know, now that doesn't really matter anymore, but 15 years ago it did. So, um, but a lot of what I had been reading about, because my mind was always more on the business side and, and why I love working with actors and, and writers and, and directors is because they're creative and I, I'm not, that is not my, my side of things, but the business side of it, an agency gives you the opportunity to kind of learn a little bit about every studio, every company, so I got this taste of what the industry could hold and I loved it. All of a sudden I'm meeting these actors who had small roles in films that I grew up watching and they're coming to me for career advice or people right on the cusp of becoming a star. And Wait a minute, they're asking the mailroom guy for career Well, not advice? at that point. No, usually then it was, it was, hey, you like my new headshot or did you like my new movie? And a, 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 well, wait a minute, so let's go to the mailroom job. I mean, uh, that, I mean, I know I started in a company and we had a mail room and there were, would be guys, people see this depicted, I think, in old movies and they don't really believe it actually existed. A person's job was to push a cart, right? And you walked around and literally delivered every person's mail. And, and now how do you go from that job and transition? Did you do it in the same company for a while? I got lucky that the company I worked at, uh, there was uh, the 
I wanted to work in the TV and film department and a desk opened up about six months after I'd been in the mail room. And it's crazy because you are working with people who are MDs. I had people, I had a friend who had been a lawyer for years and we're all sitting there stuffing envelopes, stuffing headshots and resumes, you know, running scripts all over town, but you do it because you want that, that entry. And um, over time, I, one of the agents there asked me to be her assistant and that's usually the gateway uh, in that line and, and really in any line within the entertainment business, start moving your way up. And um, she sat me down very early and said, I will make you an agent if you're willing to put the work in. And I, of course, was willing to. I was working at for- that point, At that point, did you even know what was involved in that job? Had you, had you been there long enough to know exactly what that meant? Within six months, yes, uh, I had gotten in because I had, you know, the company I was able to bounce around and work in a commercial department, work in voiceover and, and get kind of a quick, broad education of all these different careers. I didn't know a, a thing about voiceover. I got out there and saw it and all I could think about was, God, what a great career. These people, they do it from their, their you know, basement and their pajamas and, and, you know, could have very successful careers. It's a nice, uh, nice side of the industry. But um it was something, you know, no, I, I, until I was in it full time, it, you know, it was more for me, it was about learning the ecosystem, learning, um, you know, really what, and I talk about this a lot is creating my own brand that, that my boss was very good about teaching me, your clients are going to come and go stand on how you represent them and how people see you and you communicate and do business with them. All right, well, let's let's get it into some brass tacks because uh, that's a little bit about what we do at the Film Cafe. So, uh, and, you know, kind of define your daily work as an agent. I mean, what truly did you do? Okay, so as an agent, boiling it down brass tacks is your job is to procure work for your client. So that is, and, and there, you know, we don't need to go into the details of how, but it's, you're chasing roles on TV series, ranging from guest star roles that work several days to series regulars, recurring roles, feature films, indie films, studio films. Um, my focus was always in the TV film side. So, um, and now the business has gone this way that volume wise, you're doing a lot more TV, but day to day, it was to get my most of my actors auditions, ideally in all. So you had you, uh, every agent, of course, has their list of actors, or is that kind of a shared list within an agent, or really is it carved up that you have your list? No, that's a great question. Every agency's a little different. Um, when you get up to the point where you're repping the Brad Pitts and the Tom Cruises, yes, you pretty much represent your own. Um, where I every office I worked in. We had our own that we pointed. So if I signed you, Mike, you'd be my client, but every agent in the department would be out actively pitching you. So it's a way to divide up the labor. You've got 10, 15 different salespeople taking Mike Miller's headshot and resume and reel out. And then once it gets to the point where you get the offer or things start moving along, then because we've worked together from the start, I would kind of take the lead and work with whoever was working on it, work with you to negotiate the best deal. And, and it really was a lot about negotiation, correct? I mean, the deals were never very standardized, right? Well, it changed a lot, you know, when it came, um, and it, it was a little before I started, but uh, a lot of the guest star work really got standardized. But when you get into feature films, when you get into series regular deals, that's where a lot of the negotiating comes in. And a lot of too, and it's exciting, it's stressful, but when you're working out multiple projects, when, you know, Mike, I've got an offer for you for this big feature film, but it shoots in New Zealand and I need you for your series regular role back in Chicago. How do we navigate this? Who do we need to get on the phone? Um, it's again, and, and you're, you're sometimes dealing with a lot of ego and a lot of people who have power and are moving a lot of pieces, but you make it work to make you know it, it acceptable for your client. Now, uh, okay, so let's go back a little bit to your career path. Uh, you know, six months in, your uh, approach that uh, she'll make you her assistant, teach you the job. Uh, take us from there. Uh, how many years? What I mean, progress it a little bit. So I was there on that desk for about three and a half years. And one of that was also during the uh, writer's strike of, I think it was 2009, which was awful. It, it decimated the business. Um, my agency fired most of the support staff. They kept me and one other person who actually is still there. 
Um, but so it was getting through that, but then it was about finding the right opportunity. And unfortunately that company I was at, which I ultimately ended up back at, there were going to be some people in front of me to get promoted. And I wanted to get out there a little more. So my boss worked with me, um, to, you know, I had found a couple companies that were going to be hiring and were willing to take a shot. And at the be beginning of 2009, I transferred uh, over to a smaller company, but a bi-coastal company with good roots. And more importantly to me, they gave me my shot. To be your, to be a full agent, you're saying? Full agent. I was one of three in LA, three in New York. We represented a uh, very big theater-based What lot. was the name of the agent? Is this Abrams? This was Bauman, Rodanti, and Shawl. It's now called yeah. BRS Gage. So, but they were a company who they had a major presence uh, in TV for years. I, I had found contracts for Ted Danson on Cheers and John Ritter on Three's Company, and uh, but it was it was just a great environment. It was something where they came to me and said, "Look, here's your territory. Here are the clients. Go do it." And that show of respect to me was all I could think of was. Now I need to go out and show that you're right. Let's go make you guys some money and enjoy this. And, and we had a good uh, five-year run together. All right, let's jump in right on something you just said. Ted Danson, cheers, you got him the job? Uh, yeah, right, a little before my time. But the company that, that I worked for, they were the ones who did it. Uh, and that was you know, kind of in the early days before a lot of the residual stuff was uh, hammered out. So uh, they might still be receiving money from that. But it was a company with a lot, you know, I think we still, when I started, we still had- Wait, man, Also, I want that might still be hearing, getting money. How does that work? They, a lot of those longer term contracts that were early on, if, if the residuals, most of it's pre-negotiated now. And, so and you get, if the, if the actor is getting a cut of it for, for decades because the residual agency gets a cut of it. It, depending on the deal that was made. So what, what a lot of times happens, especially to smaller companies is you put, Mike, I put you on cheers. We don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Well, the show blows up. And over time, within a couple of years, we worked to renegotiate that deal. This is the biggest show on TV. We need, you need to be paid more than you were thinking it was just a regular show. Once, um, if I negotiate that follow-up, then I'm still getting that 10%. My company is still getting 10%. Now, if you leave me for whatever reason and go to another company and they negotiate a raise, they're going to be commissioning that raise and anything in the future. We're only owed what the original deal that you signed with us. And it's a tough part of the business, to be honest, because a lot of companies, and I've seen it firsthand, you work and work and work almost for free to get a client going. And then right when they really start to earn, they start to break, a bigger agency will come around and, and it makes sense. It's good business on their part. But they end up getting to reap a lot of the rewards. And I've seen people leave and not necessarily have that better career that they envision. They keep working, but it's no different than the work they would have been getting had they stayed put. So it's just, you know, an interesting dynamic within the business. Uh-oh, did we lose Mr. Mike? All right, well, we may have lost Mike for a second, so um, can give, you know, just a quick rundown um, my little update just right now, you know, obviously our goal is to get people back to work as soon as possible, but it has to be safe. Uh, we've been having, um, you know, really good conversations with, um, with the unions, the labor unions, and thankfully they're all working together right now to try to find ways to come up with a uniform set of rules and protocols to get people back to work. The good news is what we're hearing a lot of, and, and from a, a lot of it's outside of Cleveland, is that there's concern in LA um, that the work isn't, you know, that they're not going to be able to get back to work as soon, or New York as well. And a city like Cleveland, we are positioned to come back uh, a little sooner. So um, I guess we just, in the interim, a uh, question came in from Jim asking if any acting voice agent jobs can be gotten in the Cleveland, Ohio area. So there are a couple of smaller agencies here, um, and I apologize, I can't reference them offhand, but they are, uh, they are, you know, basically they're focused on, on mostly the local market or jobs that are gonna open up maybe in Pittsburgh or uh, might have a little room to, to work with. So, um, but 
you know, that's one side of the industry that just, you know, there, there's a good base in Chicago. There's actually a video game uh, agency that's, that's uh, in, I can't remember, I think it's Northwest Ohio. So as the business grows, there's definitely going to be the potential for more because hopefully, like you see in a place like Albuquerque, Atlanta, Austin, uh, there are, as that work starts to raise up, as there are a lot more opportunities for acting, there are going to be a need for people to represent them to get those opportunities. Uh, Sharon is wondering, do I still work as a talent agent? No, I do not. Um, I loved what I was doing, um, but my perspective really started to change uh, not long after my wife and I had our first kid, and we wanted to think about where we wanted to raise our family and where we wanted to be long-term. And Cleveland, where it, it is now relative to where I left, when I left, and it was great when I left, but now to have this industry here um, for the work that Ivan Schwartz did to get us on the map and establish, to be able to bring what I've learned back here is extremely exciting. That I, I kind of boil it down that, um, that a, a, you know, you, as an agent, your job is to get an individual actor work. As in this position, we want to see this city get work and, and we think it can have a bigger impact. So I think we, we've almost got Mr. Mike. So while he gets unmuted, the only other question, who is my favorite actor or client? You know what? You're not going to know her offhand, but if you look her up, her name was, and I think she's still alive, knock on wood, her name's Elsa Raven. This woman played the clock tower lady in Back to the Future, which if anyone knows me, that movie is, is my lifeblood. And I met her when I started repping her and I told her, if you're okay with it, I would love to take you to any event, any convention, let's get you out. And she, as a result, I got to meet Michael J. Fox. I got to meet the whole cast. I got to be part of reenactments. She's taking me around signing clock tower posters, just, and the sweetest person, you know, the woman is now, I think 92, but she would still come into the office every Christmas with pistachio nuts. I don't think anyone in the office ate them, but we, we loved Elsa that uh, we were definitely, uh, you know, it didn't matter what she brought, so. Well, sorry, folks, uh, I'm having a little internet connection problem out of my house. Again, I'm not the music box, so appreciate your patience there. And thanks, Evan, for uh, vamping a little bit. <laughs> I do my best. As, as we said earlier, you know, I, I don't know if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm bombing or doing well, but it's all right. I can't hear cricket, so. Well, you know, the good news is we have 185 participants. I hope they're drinking beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, again, let's progress a little bit to, uh, you know, so you really stayed at this for how many years? Uh, almost 15 when all was said and done. So I stayed, I was at my smaller company for five years. Abrams Artists, the company that I originally worked with, uh, went through some major changes and brought me back. Uh, it, was, it was something where I was, it was an amazing opportunity to come back to where I started. Um, and again, I, you know, I was saying this when you were off, Mike, I, I loved what I was doing, but my perspective on what I wanted to do long-term started to change about where we wanted to raise our family. And because of the work that Ivan did helping create this industry here, I had something to come back to knowing, you know, because the question was always, if we move to Cleveland, what am I going to do? My wife works in healthcare. We know that she could do something here. What am I, how am I going to transition these skills? And the this again once in a lifetime opportunity now you know a question for the the aspiring uh, folks out there that want to try and kind of uh, break into this industry do you need to be in los angeles or another major city you know to to make it in this industry there are still certain positions um agents you know i was saying earlier there's just not a big enough acting base in cleveland to get started working as an agent here i mean you you could still get opportunities but i don't think you'll they're just not going to be as as numerous as they wouldn't in an atlanta and in chicago obviously new york or la but you know when it comes to acting when it comes to obviously every production job under the sun you can get started anywhere. And it didn't used to be that way because the production hubs were in LA and New York. And then tax incentives started coming around and there was that little show Breaking Bad uh, in Albuquerque. And all of a sudden people saw that this could work. And LA, we started calling it runaway production because uh, it was leaving quickly. 
But that's the biggest difference is now you come to a city like Cleveland and you don't just, you know, hopefully have the opportunities to actually apply the trade, but really to, to learn it too, whether it's doing an intensive, doing a workshop, doing, um, you know, one of the, the, you know, schools here, whether it's CSU, Tri-C, Baldwin, Wallace, the opportunities are definitely here. And our goal is to create that year round industry so that yes, you have the skills to go anywhere in the world, but you still have the same opportunity to work here where you have all the, the creature comforts of living in Northeast Ohio. Super. Hey, Juliana, I'm going to ask you to do us a favor. Uh, again, we're going to get into a talk a little bit about the, the film industry, especially around Cleveland. Can you just put up that chart of how people can ask some questions? Let them see that chart for a second. Maybe it's already been up. <laughs> Good. All right, go. So at the bottom of your screen, guys, there should be a little Q&A that you can click on. Uh, feel free, uh, you know, uh, we are monitoring uh, this uh, closely. Uh, you know, just open it, type the question into the Q&A box, and uh, they're actually going to flow through to me. Uh, we right now have 180 participants, so if you all ask a question, we'll be here till Sunday afternoon, and we're not <laughs> probably not going to be able to handle that, but we will uh, definitely get to as many of them as we can, uh, so please feel free to uh, fill out some questions, guys. I think we have like five or six right now already. All right, Evan. So, you know, uh, I have to tell you, you almost have a movie script. Uh, you know, you uh, get, put your dog in a car, you drive to LA, you get a job in a mail room and six months later, you're on a track to be an agent. You know, uh, is that still doable today? Completely. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the industry, you know, in the work as an agent, you know, I can speak to because I was doing it for so long. It's not rocket science, it, but it, it, you know, it takes, obviously, there's a certain amount of persistence and, um, and, and, you know, as with any industry hoops, you have to jump through, but there's no reason you can't, you know, yes, timing and luck and things like that. When somebody steps away from a desk and things open up, that all plays into it. Um, but I don't think my story was any more special than a lot of the people, you know, who work, work there. You know, it's, it, it is, you know, about persevering through a lot of, you know, knowing that, it, you know, especially if you're in a city like that, it's expensive to be there. Um, you know, working side jobs are, is tough because you're working till eight o'clock every night. But if you want it bad enough, and this applies to anything in the business, you'll find a way to make it work. Um, I'd have clients that would say, well, I couldn't, I just, I couldn't create. You're an actor. And they lived in cities like LA where you had USC and UL, UCLA. Approach a student, create a student film, do something, you know, that, you know, it's, um, we say it all the time, but you, you can lead a horse to water. So it's, you know, you, but obviously no guarantee they'll drink. And that's a big part of the business too. Uh, I mean, was there anything that set you apart? Do you look back on it now? Was there anything that set you apart? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously it was my willingness to, to do, you know, pretty much anything they asked me. Um, it was, you know, being consistent and, you know, but I think a big part of it was a lot of what we've all grow up with here in the Midwest, a certain value system and a certain way of doing business. You know, look, I had plenty of people that I worked with who are great, but do give off more of that entourage vibe. And I, I, you know, all due respect to them. I like doing it a little more like me, you know, we knew we weren't curing cancer. Yes, we have to put food on the table and take it seriously, but let's enjoy this. Let's, you know, figure out each project and do it practically um, and how to approach those. And at the end of the day too, it's about making money for these companies, you know, whoever you're working for. So, um, you know, I was fortunate to have a good stable of clients that I worked with and met and was referred to over the years that worked steadily and, and gave me the opportunity to build my career. All right. Name a few. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I've worked it's with a privacy thing. <laughs> well, no, it's, you know, it's just, it's a wide range and it's something to, you know, it, everyone, you know, has watched and seen different things. You know, I've, I've you know, worked with, you know, the likes of, you know, Leslie Odom or Joe Manganiello. I've worked with people like Chris Pratt and Morgan Fairchild. I mean, I've worked, you know, uh, David Hasselhoff was bumping around our office. I mean, it's a very wide array of people. 
Um, and most, you know, a lot of them, you know, in, in TV was a big part of our business. So, you know, it was exciting to be able to put people on Breaking Bad early and ride that wave with those actors and see where they got to go and how that show changed the business in general. All right. So uh, talk a little bit about, you know, early years and income. I mean, were you making any money at all? Or, I mean, none. I didn't think so. <laughs> so I was clearing after taxes $300 a week. Uh, I would get paid every two weeks, $600. As an agent or as an assistant. As an assistant. Um, and it was, it was tough. Uh, so, and, you know, with those hours, I had to find side jobs that I could do uh, if I could do data entry during lunch stuff I could do at night. I worked as a flag football referee. I emceed uh, parties for uh, uh, an event company, bartended. I, you know, I did anything that could fit into the hours, but it was important to me that I wanted to stay out there. Um, I needed to find a way to make this work until I could get to that level where I was going to be an agent and, you know, hopefully start taking off from there. Now, when, uh, I, I think you kind of hinted about it. I mean, when did you really start hearing about this opportunity back in Cleveland? So it literally was a cold call uh, of mine that it was around the time my daughter was born and I had, you know, seen Avengers and, and uh, you know, I'm the goofball in the theater screaming, that's, that's Cleveland, that's Cleveland right there. And they don't know what I'm talking about, but, um, but my wife I just- says that all the time still. <laughs> So I, I kept seeing more and more, and I, I, it just was one of those thoughts of somebody's doing this, who's doing it? And I found Ivan's info, and I reached out to him and, and just said, look, I don't know if I can help, but I am a crazy Clevelander. I'm in L.A., and I'd love to know more about what you're doing. And I think deep down, my goal was probably to work with him. I, I never anticipated being able to take over for him. But, you know, to his credit, he got back to me within a couple hours. We had a lunch set up because he was going to be in L.A., and we just forged this relationship where he was, you know, constantly keeping me informed of what they were up to, you know, any mutual connections we may have had. And, and we just stayed in touch. Um, and then last year when I was looking to make a change in, in my current position, I reached out to him and uh, again, had no idea that this was, you know, potentially in the works, but uh, all's well that ends well. Is Mike back on his dial up modem again? All right. Well, I guess I'm vamping again. Well, while I wait, let's see. We are going to answer a couple more questions. Um, Kevin asks, how do you feel your talent agent career can help you in your current position with the film commission? So great, you know, question. Um, you know, what I was saying earlier, the big big part is just the brass tacks of it of my job is to was to create work help clients get work and that's the same situation here um we want to obviously advocate uh and 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 or excuse me attract as much production and be out there but then we want to make sure these productions come here and have an opportunity to work with with locals that are in the industry, um, which I think is going to happen more now just due to the virus and not traveling as many people. So, um, but then also it's just really about, you know, problem solving and building a brand again, letting people know, you know, we're not going to be tied to, you know, Cleveland's identity is not going to be tied to any one film, just as uh, an actor's, you know, career typically isn't. But it's about that body of work and creating that long-term growth here. Um, and, and having seen that and building the arcs of careers for clients, being able to do that in this setting. So, um, have I, okay. So a question from Facebook, have I ever been part of the filmmaking industry outside of being an agent? Uh, I have not, you know, so when I got started out there, uh, I was kind of, you know, I, I looked into, you know, I think I, I tooled around as kind of a, a friend of somebody working on a set. I was an audience member for a couple of things, but um, got into the agency thing. And, and I tell people that my career is, is weird in our industry because it was linear. Most of my friends who I worked with anywhere from a month to several years at an agency moved on to different parts of the business. And it was some left the business, but it was all very, you know, disparate, um, which I always liked that, that 
you know, working where I was gave me an opportunity to say, okay, uh, that's what a writer does. That's what a producer's doing. I don't, this doesn't sound like what I want to do. This sounds more like what I want to do. So, um, so it just, you know, gave me kind of a taste. And again, I, I really liked what I was doing, but I've seen it be just that good way to kind of leapfrog. So, okay. John is, what should I look for when picking an agent? Um, so, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, these, an agent, their job is to represent you. The, you can, as an actor, typically the, the higher paying jobs, the, the, the bigger gigs are going to have, you're not going to be able to self-submit and get yourself in the mix for. You're going to need someone representing you. So really it's about someone um, who understands you and gets you but is working for you and calling on your so behalf and sending emails on your behalf. Hey, Mr. Miller is back. Um, so it's, you know, that's the biggest thing, you know, letterhead and a fancy building or car is great, but if nobody's picking up the phone on your behalf, then it's just letterhead. So uh, really it's about making sure that person's working for you. Hey folks, I think I'm permanently fixed here. I went to a different laptop. <laughs> Can you hear me? We can. Okay, perfect. But I lost my background. <laughs> oh, I'm no longer across the river. So again, I apologize for the uh, glitches, guys. Uh, uh, again, uh, and apologize. Uh, I was talking to you. Uh, you know, I'm assuming that as I was away, that uh, you were answering questions about the state of the industry here. No. So we haven't gotten into that, and that's a great, great uh, segue. So. The state of the industry is good, but it can be better. Let's, let's take out the coronavirus of it all and, and kind of just look at it straight on. That um, we, our state has a $40 million annual motion picture and TV tax credit. It's a, a way, um, it became the tool to start attracting productions away from New York and LA, uh, kind of incentivize producers to be there, especially when a lot of the resources aren't necessarily there, studio space, whatnot. So we have a very competitive one, so much so that it gets used up very quickly. Um, the reality is we're not in a position to be able to support year-round work without that incentive because without that here, produ productions at this point, they're gonna be mobile. So if they can use Cleveland to double Chicago, great. But if it's going to be cheaper to do it in Portland, they're going to go to Portland. You know, they're not beholden to a city typically. So you have to have that carrot to dangle. Then we have all the things, value on the dollar, great people, great work base. Um, but that incentive, we need to find a way to, to expand it so that we can, can tell productions year round, yes, we have money available, come on in. Because that money doesn't come out of you know, the, the laborers pockets, that's, that's money that's going to help get people, you know, back to work money that then they're going to in turn spend within their local economy. I mean, the, the ripple effects are significant. Now, uh, you know, talk a little bit. I mean, I know that, uh, you know, quite honestly, I've been talked directly about exactly what you said a lot. Uh, this has gotten very competitive, uh, among cities and States and, uh, some of them are throwing lots of money on it. I mean, what do you think the prospects are here? What has been now your impression of the prospects here in Ohio of, of getting some, especially after this pandemic and the economic I think, impact? I think they're, they're, they're good. You know, we do know we, you know, uh, Governor DeWine is very behind the incentive program. It does have bipartisan support. And we, we are in the process right now, we're, we're commissioning a study that's going to give us some more concrete numbers on what the incentive, the impact is and what it could be if we were to raise it. Um, but I think, you know, as communities get back to work and as it's safe to get back, that this industry can be a really good way to get a lot of people back to work that may not have jobs to go back to right now. And by doing that, I think we can help galvanize more people in the state to realize, look, there's potential to build an industry here. We're not trying to make this Hollywood 2.0. We're still going to do it Cleveland's way, but this is a new, exciting industry that can be anywhere. Why not have it be here? And uh, again, uh, describe a little bit about uh, th how this directly impacts the choice that a production company makes. 
So, of course. So, you know, a production is going to have a script and sometimes they have to shoot, you know, in whatever locale the script requires. But most of the studios, the major studios, they have people that their job is to study tax incentives. They get handed a script and they say, okay, Bill, we have this, this takes place. We need somewhere that's urban. We need somewhere that's rural. And then most of it, we're just going to need A, B, and C. What do we have? And the first thing they do is look and, and look across the country and say, okay, who's got competitive tax incentives? Because to studios, to any filmmaker, that is money right off the top that you, you can save. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a bottom line business. So if they can save more money by shooting it here as opposed to Chicago, they'll do it. So that's, you know, no matter what, you know, again, we offer great established crew base we offer value on the dollar but the bean counters you know the accountants and whatnot they're only looking at the bottom line and when they say well you can shoot it for five million dollars less if you go to pennsylvania because they have 70 million in their tax credit and ohio doesn't have anything right now most business people are going to say that's five million i've got to take i got to save that i got gotcha. you now what makes ohio attractive for filming overall. I mean, what, you know, I know it was great for the Avengers. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, tax incentive aside, we have obviously very, very diverse landscapes. We joke that we have everything but a mountaintop and a desert. Um, although with camera technology, we could probably make some things look that way. So, um, so you've got that, you've got the cost of doing business here is always going to be less than doing it in a New York, in a Los Angeles. Um, ease of use is a huge thing. You know, a project like Avengers, you know, it's not easy to shut down a whole city street by any stretch, but it's a lot easier to do it in a city like Cleveland or even Pittsburgh than it is in, you know, in New York City. And, you know, I, I tell the story that, that we were on the set of this Liam Neeson film in September, the Minuteman that shot here. And some of the neighbors uh, on the street they were shooting came out to bring cookies to the, to the crew. And, you know, LA, yes, people come and stand and are friendly, but more times than not, they're saying, you're in my, my yard and you're blocking traffic. And there's just a certain way, again, that people do business here um, that I think goes a long way because, you know, every producer that, that I've had the, the pleasure of meeting on the films that, that have worked here, of course, there are things that come up, stuff that could go better, but they all leave saying, I don't think we're going to find a more cost-effective place to do business. We love being here. The actors love being here. We're going to find a way. And that's what we want. We need, you know, it's, it's not just to hook, you know, projects here and there. It's to get one to say, okay, you know what? Now we're committing a series. Now we're going to look to really set up shop. And you've seen it in other cities. There's no reason it can't be here. Cool. All right, we're going to turn to some of the questions now. We've got a whole bunch of them, and there's some good ones, Evan. So, so. Uh, Gabe asked, can you talk a little bit more about some of the ways uh, the Greater Cleveland Film Commission gets actors, auditions, and work? Of course. So we do not directly, uh, obviously, get uh, an actor auditions. So, you know, that is, is you know, going to fall ultimately on either the individual actor or, or if you have an agent here. But what we do, you know, our job is to, you know, our mission, we're dry, trying to drive economic growth through TV and film production. But part of that is helping develop this workforce and being the conduit into the industry. So as projects are coming up, we publicize them as we can that that you know as projects come in oftentimes they'll reach out to us hey we're going to be doing a casting call can you get the info out there is a you know a good base and i think it's growing of casting directors and that's really you know where in at least in cleveland right now the focus should be is that it's there are only a handful of people doing it so try to get on their radar now um you know getting materials to cast to the casting community so that you get on the radar now, not so much when that one role comes in and the whole world is reaching out to them. So, um, but for us, it's promoting when we know these projects are coming in. Uh, and also, look, we're, we're available. So if you do have questions, you're wondering what's coming up, we will share that info as we can. But I mean, but do, but you do put out a casting call. You do. We will. It. Yes. We'll put out the info that we can, you know, sometimes they go right to the casting director. You know, there are 
a, a few here that that have good long-standing relationships with producers that we hear sometimes directly from casting oh hey these are the roles they're now looking and again we're going to do everything we can to promote it and our goal is to see these roles become more numerous and to become bigger speaking to a city like atlanta you know right now cleveland we're getting a lot of smaller roles you know a few lines co-stars but you start having series in 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 northeast ohio you start looking at the guest starring roles the recurring roles the roles that you really can cut your teeth on and start to build a resume um you know that's what we want to see oh for sure now, I uh, had another follow-up question with a Andrea asking, what film shows will be shot in Cleveland in the upcoming years? Are you aware of some stuff? So right now, you know, the big one we'll, we can publicly discuss is there was a film that was going to be here in uh, April called Undercover, a Lionsgate film. Obviously, they've been put on hold, but as these protocols are getting in place, they are looking to come back once things are safe. So we're hoping you know, if it, once the governor oh, did they starts, already have, did they already have some of the money? Block oh, they're, they, they've had, yes, they've been awarded their tax incentive. They were here doing pre-production when this all shut down. Okay. So, um, and they were kind of the last of the money for fiscal year, 2019, 2020. So, um, right now, with the fiscal year starting back up in July, the the State Development Services Agency is going to start awarding the incentive again July 1st. So we have, there are some projects that have applied. We are having constant conversations. I think um, my our production coordinator, Mike Went and I are having at least three or four a day with different studios, different producers to know what's going on here, what's the process for getting um in the application process and and what it's looking like to reopen and i'm excited because it's not just films or big budget films it's indie films it's uh series it's mini series and and that that consistent work is what's exciting well i mean that led right into a question from amy uh that we got uh you know have you begun hearing from the governor's office uh you know what some of the guidelines might be for this to reopen you know, uh, around, you know, protocols, they're, they're putting out protocols almost industry by industry. Are, do you expect them to actually address this industry or? You know, that's a good question. And, you know, we do have, you know, our, our feelers out, you know, obviously the focus has been on, on some of the, the, you know, the other industries, which we totally get. So um, I think a lot of it is, you know, the biggest thing that we're running into right now is the 10 person limit and trying to figure out how we navigate around that. But nobody's really going to be able to go back to work until the labor unions that are involved in production, which here are uh, the IA and Teamsters, and then obviously SAG and, and everything else. But until they come up with their codified you know, protocols, people aren't going to be able to go back to work. So the hope is that by the time those come into place, which we're hearing can be mid-June, it could be in a couple of weeks, it, 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 it's in process is the good thing. The hope is that that'll align with more restrictions being loosened because I was just reading, I mean, now, you know, you can have a wedding of up to 300. Well, it stands to reason then you could have a production as long as, as they're being safe and following the protocols that the unions are setting for. All right, perfect. Okay, we actually got a question in from a, a Facebook uh, person, uh, Chris on Facebook. Do you think there might be a resurgence in the spec screenplay market? Right now, uh, there is. For my friends who are uh, lit agents and whatnot, there has been more of a push in development. Now, um, you know, a lot of the studios are getting restless because they want to get back to work. It's great to have this mound of content. Have any means of getting it produced right now? It's just sitting there. Um, you know, does that mean that your odds of it getting noticed are are better? It's hard to say. I couldn't say that, you know, because I'm sure a lot of people have the idea of, hey, well, now's the time. Everyone's looking at content. But, you know, the big thing is that, you know, even before coronavirus, and I think it really shows it as well, there's been a need and a desire for more content than ever. And the market's changed. You know, you could write what you perceive as a series, and all of a sudden it becomes an on-demand film or, or a miniseries. There are just so many more avenues of getting your your stuff out there. You know, I look at a company like Gravitas Ventures in, in Cleveland, which is a major video on-demand distributor based here. And, 
you know, but what they're doing in, in the market that they're able to create for films that may not have been able to get that distribution, that's exciting. So more content than ever, you know, to make a long story short. It, I mean, it, it, it seems that way, that the, the demand for content is actually growing, right? I mean, it's just unbelievable. They, uh, the number they came out with earlier this year was that there were 519 scripted hours of TV programming uh, last year. So we're talking scripted stuff on Netflix, Hulu, ABC, NBC, all of those, everything but features. And it's getting watched. And there's, you know, that was before we were all locked down and needed content. So um, there's, uh, there's going to be more, there's going to be more avenues to do it. So, you know, now is as good a time as ever to really get into it. Cool. All right. Uh, question, another one from Facebook, Wayne asks, how is the $40 million Ohio tax incentive split between Cleveland and the other large cities like Columbus and Cincinnati? Is it pre-allocated or based on opportunity and how much comes to Cleveland? That's a great question. So up until this year, it had been anything that applied, priorities were given to series and miniseries because they are multiple episodes and then everything else was first come first serve. As of July 1st, they're still gonna give that priority to series and miniseries, but then everything else they're going to look at and measure based on the economic impact it's going to have in the states. So they're going to look at the uh, impact of local wage numbers and local production crew numbers. This is the state's decision. This is how they're going to administer the law. So, um, you know, so geographically, there isn't a, a split. Okay, a third goes to Cleveland, a third goes to Cincinnati. Um, you know, we, it tends that, and, and historically, you know, 70% or so does tend to come up here. Um, but I've had conversations and I'm, I know my, my, you know, um, uh, associates. Is there a counterpart? Is there yes. a Columbus film? There's a Columbus film commissioner and a Cincinnati film commissioner. So there isn't a state one, but you know, I, we all kind of take the approach of, you know, yes, I want it to be here, but if for whatever reason they can't shoot in Cleveland, I'd rather have it shoot in Cincinnati and still have that money come in or Columbus than have it leave and there's no impact. So, um, but, you know, historically, um, a lot of the business tends to come up here, but Cincinnati does a very good amount. Um, we just, we're also very active in, in being out and trying to attract new productions as well, which I think, uh, you know, has helped the commission out. Well, and uh, another question that follows up on that, BJ asks, any chance smaller productions will be able to partake in the tax incentive while things are getting back into motion? I think so. You know, they, the, the budget minimum is 300000 So you still have to have a budget over 300000 uh, to be able to apply for the tax incentive. Um, but there's no reason that, you know, it's, it's not going to be considered. I mean, if, if you are going to be hiring, you know, yes, it's lower budget, but if it's going to be hiring a good amount of local crew and it's, 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 you know, it's not so as black and white as what are the dollar figures, you know, I think the state's going to do their best to try to look, you know, uh, at, at each application kind of on, on its own merits. And at the end of the day, we just want to support production. Uh, big budget films are great. Indies are great too. Work is work here. So. All right. Well, I just got a, a text from my sister in Milwaukee. So she's watching. <laughs> and here's her question. Are we going to be have TV shows to watch this fall? So that's interesting. Um, yes and no. Um, some of the broadcast seasons, they're all trying to figure out what they're going to do. That that are they um, going to push? You know that that a season will still happen, but the shows, the big network shows, are they going to not start airing new episodes until January or February? And it's possible, but there is enough content that's in post production. Um, all the networks, all the studios are going to pivot, and it's interesting. I was reading about how certain networks are buying shows that were not really hitting it out of the park or on smaller networks like Charter Communications. And now CW is saying, hey, we'll buy that. It's, it's cheaper than producing a new show. So there, there's enough content out there that they'll be able to fill the gaps, but things are going to come back fast and furious. All right, great. Uh, I think this is a great question. Uh, kind of uh, a good bridge here, Evan. Wendy Gray asks, what can we do as a film community here in Cleveland 
to support you guys, support you and film production in a time when, uh, you know, we don't know what the future is. That is a great question. And one of the things a lot of people don't know about us, and, and we are structured differently, you know, a lot of film commissions in California and New Mexico, they're state run organizations. Uh, in Ohio, we are not, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we do not receive any money. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, production comes here, they write us a check and we keep going. And that isn't the case at all. Um, a lot of times it gets even more expensive for us during those times because we have to be constantly, you know, we're, we're servicing the production. We want to make sure they get, you know, the Cleveland red carpet treatment, so to speak. So um, as a nonprofit, you know, we are constantly fundraising. And this year has been tough because we were hoping to do some, you know, more, you know, screenings and some more, you know, just getting the movie community out there, not just people who work in production, people who just love TV and film and trying to engage with them. Um, but because we haven't been able to, we've switched more to a virtual setting um, and, and really just trying to encourage donations, uh, clevelandfilm.com and we can, you know, we'll show a slide and, and I can get into a little later some of uh, stuff we have coming up. Um, but really it's, you know, every little bit helps. It's something that, you know, we've been fortunate. We've been able to work from home. It hasn't slowed us down. Um, but we don't want it to slow us down, you know, and, and we want to be able to keep going and keep providing this service to the productions and then to the community as well, because we want to make sure that at the end of the day, this city is what's getting lifted up. Perfect. All right. Uh, one final uh, question for me, Evan. Again, this is to those aspiring folks out here in Cleveland. Uh, you know, what, what is your kind of final piece of advice in terms, and be practical, you know, how to, how to, you know, everybody thinks, you know, there's acting, there's directing, you know, there are these huge jobs, but really there's a lot of other routes into this industry. Uh, yes. You know, what is your final kind of practical piece of advice about getting into this industry? Yeah, I, you know, I think you have to go in, you can have your vision of how, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to be a set designer. Uh, that's what I want to do. And you have to go in with no blinders on and, you know, be, be ready to be prepared and uh, on time. I know that sounds simple, but a lot of people can't do that. Um, but to be able to walk in and say, oh, wow, I didn't know about this position. I mean, I, again, you know, for me, it was voiceover. And then I, you know, every time I'm on set, I see a new position. I'm like, yeah, they do need that. Okay, that makes sense. You see all these other industries. So it's going in wide open. And it's also too, it's being, you have to be proactive to look at opportunities. You know, we're, we're far from the stone age here in Cleveland when it comes to the entertainment industry. There are a lot of good commercial production companies, um, on-demand companies. There, there's a good base here. Take your time to do the research and, and, and reach out and start, even if you don't, they don't have a job for you today, they might tomorrow. But it's about starting to build that base so people say, okay, Mike, you're on it, man. I, I remember talking to you. You were so passionate. I do have this project. I need you. Why don't you come and work? So, um, you know, so it's, it's being proactive, being patient, uh, and, and being prepared and, and on time. Uh, it, it goes a, an extremely long way. All right. Perfect. Okay, folks, we're actually really excited tonight because this is going to be a fairly typical film cafe. We are going to move along here and, and show some films in a few minutes uh, from some filmmakers that have continued working here in Cleveland. And, uh, you know, this is something that we can feed you over uh, the Zoom here. Uh, to wrap up kind of the uh, a little, I'm going to give a little music box uh, pitch here. Uh, we're excited uh, because we are going to be opening at the music box um, in uh, uh, mid-June, Thursday, June 18th. You're seeing a slide here. We're even more excited. We've got Bob DeBasio. If you guys out there don't know who Bob DeBasio is, he is been with the Cleveland Indians for almost 40 years as their VP of PR. He is a huge Indians historian. He really knows their history going way back. You know, they started as the Spiders uh, before they were renamed the Indians. So that's on Thursday the 18th, folks. Uh, we uh, made a little change. We're moving these to Thursday nights uh, instead of Wednesdays uh, through the summer. 
Uh, we also have made a little change. Of course, we are going to be doing these very safely. Um, we are going to have our staff fully trained, our staff in masks. Uh, we're going to have social distancing. Uh, the music box is fortunate. We have a large venue. Uh, we can definitely separate the tables by six feet. Uh, we have a garage door that uh, walks out to the uh, Cuyahoga River. And so uh, we're going to have fresh air every night. We can have that door open. Uh, but because the seats are limited, what we're asking people to do is pre-purchase a $5 voucher good on food, their good, good on their food and beverage that night. Uh, I just call it a little skin in the game so that uh, they, people uh, don't let seats, because we have some limited seats, go on empty. Uh, so, uh, again, folks, uh, look at our calendar, musicboxclee.com, and uh, we're kicking off with Bobby D, but again, we'll be bringing back some fun concerts. We'll be bringing back uh, some storytellers all summer. So we're going to be back open. We're going to be doing it very safely. We're hoping that you support us. So uh, now, again, we're going to shift and start showing some films. I'm very fortunate. Uh, I don't organize the film cafe myself. Uh, I have uh, Antonio Harper from West 10 Productions, and I have uh, Brent Stowe from uh, Emerge Film Series. Uh, Brent has been doing his own film series for a long time. So, Antonio, I hope you don't have the computer problems I had tonight. I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, and you can start introducing the directors. Evan, uh, uh, thank you so much for, this was Evan's idea, folks, uh, that we might do this on virtual. We had him scheduled to be live at the Music Box, and we decided to do the virtual version. Any final words? Oh, I'm sorry, Evan, you know, I missed it. Uh, you didn't get to show your slide yet. Uh, how can the community uh, help you uh, and, uh, you know, maybe partake in some of the stuff that you guys offer that not only puts some money uh, into the film commission, but also gives them some training. Great. Thank you, Mike. So, yes. Yeah, so uh, on the screen, we obviously we have a little bit uh, just what we do in terms of, you know, being connected here with the local crew, helping getting uh, anyone interested uh, in the industry, keeping them in the industry, keeping them here. Uh, and then also working on more of our workforce development programs, attracting, you know, production being here and then advocating for us to, you know, have a good tax incentive and, and for the work to be here. So um, biggest thing is please, please, please uh, try to stay up on clevelandfilm.com. We're active on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, just constantly posting updates on what we're hearing, but then opportunities. Um, consider, you know, a, a $25 membership to us gets you certain screening invites, a little swag, and, and goes a long way. Uh, we're also excited uh, that we're just announcing this now, and it will actually, we'll, we'll have the registration up uh, tomorrow, but we are going to do what we've called uh, behind, between the screens. It's going to be our virtual behind the camera event with Catherine Hahn, who, uh, you know, grew up in Cleveland, uh, obviously has an amazing acting career now, but got her start here, and we're excited that she's going to come in and uh, help support the Film Commission. It's going to be a free event, Tuesday, June 2nd at 7, so just keep an eye. Uh, there will be Q&A, uh, a portion, but it should be a lot of fun, so keep an eye out, and just consider donating. We're also... Um, I think uh, the slides are coming here that um, we've also, we have a program called Film Skills. So if you want to talk about ways, things you can do now while you're at home, this is, we offer uh, through a program called Film Skills, online training and certification uh, on just about every industry uh, side of the business. So it's a great way either to kind of dip your toe in or, you know, kind of go down that rabbit hole and, and learn about every industry, you know, part of the industry. And we're offering kind of some special pricing right now. So check that out. And then this is my favorite, uh, designed by our amazing staff, Julie Johnson, who's, who's uh, helping run this. This is our Quiet on the Set GCFC masks. They're right now only gonna be available for about another week. So if you go to our website, there'll be a link to take you there. Um, and you know, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of people go back to work and be, be rocking these as well. So, but please, yeah, clevelandfilm.com, uh, slash donate. We constantly keep it up to date with events. Every little bit helps. And we just appreciate all the, the support within the community. 
Well, I, Evan, I wish you could hear the applause that you would normally get at this time of the evening at the Music Box. Uh, thank you so much. You did a great job. And uh, again, guys, we are gonna now shift into seeing some films. So, uh, you know, Brent Stowe with Emerge helped put together some of these films. Antonio from West 10G helped put together some of these films. Antonio, I'm gonna take, turn over the MC responsibilities to you. Take it from here. Awesome. There we go. Hey guys. Um, thanks again, Mike and, and Evan, um, for, you know, giving us this, this opportunity to do this during this time. Um, I always feel like there's, there's, um, uh, here. There we go. Um, always great ideas coming from the film commission. Evan, again, thank you so much for uh, bringing this to us and, uh, yeah, enough, enough about, Enough about us. We're going to try to jump right into these films. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup from uh, local filmmakers as well as um, uh, film students as well. So uh, if this is your first time at the Film Cafe, uh, you're in for a treat. If you've been here before, you already know, what's, you know what to expect in terms of uh, all these great films. So first up, we're going to get, uh, get this thing rolling with Greg. Uh, Greg's joining us. Um, and so, Greg, I just want you to give, uh, give your, a little bit of background about yourself and um, what was the inspiration for your film? Yeah, so uh, I'm Greg Gellick. I'm uh, from Elyria, Ohio. Um, I've been making short films since I was a teenager, and then I just recently graduated with my BA from Cleveland State uh, for film, television, and interactive media. Um, so the idea for this film was, um, it was really just a conversation between me and a couple other filmmakers. Uh, we just wanted to shoot something on film. Um, you know, that's kind of a rarity these days with everything being on digital. Um, right. So we just kind of started like pitching around some ideas. Um, and we came to this, this story about this guy who um, finds an interesting character um, in this kind of like seedy warehouse. and stuff happens um so yeah it really it was, it was just i honestly didn't even think it was going to happen at first just a couple guys talking like oh we should shoot on film again and then a few months later and several hundred dollars later we actually made the thing right all right well yeah let's let's definitely check it out i know it was one of the uh the first films that we we came across when we uh initially put this out so uh definitely excited to show this to everybody and uh yeah let's roll the film
All right, so sorry about that for the uh, the film. And actually, the audio kind of came uh, cut out for technical technical issues. But um, but yeah, let's actually get Greg back up on here because um, I guess it's a good thing that there was uh, a silent film um, in in its uh, originality. So I wanted to actually ask um, a quick question, and, and people feel free to also send um, send questions uh, through the chat, but. I, my, the question I wanted to ask initially was, I saw this in uh, color for the first time when I first was um, received the copy. And so I wanted to see um, why you chose to go with black and white or if that was the initial um, thought when you were shooting on film or, um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to get that, that uh, perspective from you. Yeah, so I actually, when we first were in pre-production and whatnot, um, I originally wanted to shoot it on black and white. Um, and then like the other producers and our DP, like through conversation, um, we decided that we, we had one day of test footage where we burned about two minutes of film just to test it out. Right. Um, so we decided for that test footage, um, we'll just get it in color. So then we could see it in you know, both color and black and white. Um, and I actually really, really liked how it looked in color. Yeah. Uh, so we decided to make, you know, the official cut in color mm -hmm. and then this is actually something i just did the color on this one myself to have kind of like that alternative black and white version um i partially just did it because i wanted to see what it would look like in black and white yeah yeah i um, mean i do i think it looks good so this is kind of like the the alternative second version of it right so we have a a question uh from the chat and it's uh, about where where was this filmed at so this was filmed at uh, a place called Mather Mansion at Cleveland State University. Um, it's just kind of like this big, like, mansion. Um, and you can, like, rent out different rooms for parties and stuff. And this is actually in their basement, which I don't even think there's an option to rent the basement because why would anyone want to, like, hang out in there? But, right. yeah, the basement of Mather Mansion at Cleveland State. Awesome. And so when you were initially thinking about um, this, so film was – Film was the idea of shooting it on 60 millimeter. Had you had any experience before that uh, shooting on film or Super 8 or, or whatever it, it may have been? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've shot, um, I've directed a couple films on 16 millimeter. Um, and I actually was the DP on another couple films for 16 millimeter. It was um, at the old Cleveland State Film School, there was a class where you would have to shoot a couple films on like a Bull X. Right. Um, so I was in that class. Um, I directed, like I said, two films, shot a couple films for some other people. And that was all black and white on a Bolex. This mm -hmm. was on a Ari Flex. Um, so it was a little bit different. Little, yeah, a little, little bit, a little bit, right? <laughs> right, yeah. But I, did, I had some minimal experience with it. Yeah. And our DP did as well. He was in that same class. Okay, and um, I guess a, a follow-up with, uh, with just the, the film itself. How – how long did it take um, it to film this sequence or the, mm -hmm. the, the short? Right. So it took, we had two full days of shooting. Um, and then we did maybe like half a day worth of pickups. Wow. And so with that, um, were there any challenges on when you were shooting with, uh, when you were shooting on film? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so one issue we had is, you know, we're shooting on like a 30 year old camera. Um, so we actually ran into an issue where around the, luckily it was the end of the second day. Um, it just started jamming and we couldn't figure it out. Um, and we actually had like a couple people come look at it that weren't even on the set. Um, and we eventually just like somehow, I don't remember how, but we learned that just with it being an older camera, it just needed like some time to rest, which mm -hmm. luckily, like I said, we just got it through all of our pickups and whatnot. Um, and another big challenge with it being a special effects film, you know, there's only one actor um, right. in the whole thing. He's playing two characters. You can't like look back at right. any of the footage you shot. Right. Um, so we had to be really careful when we were doing all the split screen stuff mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, the camera never moved. Um, 
because we couldn't even check to see, you know, double check the framing, make sure it's right, there. right. All and that. so with that, um, when you're when you're looking now at filming on uh, something digital compared to you know sixteen millimeter, which one do you prefer? Do you have a preference, or uh, is there just a different look that you? It does it depend very on project. Usually that's what it is. But for you personally, mm -hmm. what? Uh, is digital or is it is it more film like the you know the actual film stock itself? Um, I honestly kind of prefer shooting on digital just because that's how I was brought up myself. You know, having like digital cameras, shooting stuff on my phone. Um, but I do, you know, I love shooting on film too. For me, it kind of comes down to what the project is. Um, right. So, like the other film I directed on 16 millimeter it was like a like an homage to Charlie Chaplin so like that made sense right like right this I wanted it to feel like kind of like a 70s film so again it like it made sense here yeah um I'd say for me if I don't have a reason I'll normally go with digital yeah and Plus, so I mean, it's uh, cheaper right yeah yeah because it's like hundreds of dollars just for the the film stock and you know 300 feet or 500 feet wherever it may be mm -hmm. um and so i guess the last final question we have here is what what's your next project what do you have um you know in the works have you been working on things while in quarantine or uh have you been looking forward to like certain projects or or, or what mm -hmm. yeah so i actually have quite a few music videos that i've directed over the last year that aren't out currently but they're pretty much done and it's just a matter of like waiting for the artists to decide when they're going to drop them awesome. um which i think should be soon and then i'm actually in pre-production on a short film which we pretty much got the whole thing casted we're just looking for some locations and i'm crossing my fingers i'm hoping we're going to shoot that sometime next month but we'll awesome. see what happens Awesome. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you too, Greg. Uh, thank you again for, for coming and taking the time to show your film and give us a little background on it. Uh, we definitely thank you for, for stopping by and we'll look out, make sure to keep an eye out for all your future films. Cool. Thanks. I appreciate it. Awesome. All right. So moving along, we have our next filmmaker, um, Abby. She's going to be joining us in. And um, yeah, we, we just kind of, this is another really interesting film. Um, I, I definitely want to get some insight uh on your background and and just kind of your your thoughts so yeah give us a little bit, bit of background on you and uh this film okay hi there we go <laughs> okay um hi my name is abby um sorry if you can hear sounds outside um it's, 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 been it's going by right now. that's right yeah Cool. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm a third year film student at Cleveland State. Um, I transferred after going to Kent State for a year. Um, I've been having a really good time at CSU. I'm definitely happy that I made the transition. I feel like I'm learning a lot and uh, um, having fun just meeting a lot of new people and making films. Uh, so the film that I made for my end of the semester project this year had to be uh, an available resource film. Um, so just using things that we couldn't use the school's equipment or anything. So I have had the idea for a while to make a film about being alone and this whole concept fit perfectly in. Right, with yeah, yeah. Project. So that's what I decided to do. And that's, Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's, let's roll, let's roll the film. I definitely, um, I love that, that background now knowing the, uh, the, you know, having seen the film and everything. So yeah, let's definitely check this out.
suis devenue une femme. Une femme seule. Awesome. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Abby. That's, uh, I, my first, my first initial thought was why, um, why in French? Why was that a, a choice that you decided to have or approach with this film? Um, so actually kind of the story behind that was, um, at the very beginning of quarantine, I watched a movie. So that's actually not me speaking. It's from a movie. Um, right. Uh, by Agnes Varda from the 70s. Uh, she's a French filmmaker. And basically the movie is about two women going throughout their lives uh, and like coming in and out of each other's lives. And um, one of them is a single mother. So uh, she just has this moment of dialogue talking about how she's alone and, you know, living and alone and she's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that like those lines just really like I was like oh that's me right now you yeah. know and I, I think a lot of people too just with the whole isolation and, and, and quarantine definitely can can relate with that and I think one um, I know we, we kind of touched on this with with Greg's film um, having his in black and white what was some of the motivation for having your uh, having it shot in that way in black and white um, so I guess the reason I wanted it in black and white was because I've never done anything in black and white before, even though it's kind of just, when you shoot on digital, it's kind of just a filter you put on, but right. I've never made anything to be in black and white before. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt like the film was almost um, showing a lot of myself. And I kind of felt that the black and white was just keeping a layer up that I wanted to be there. Yeah. So kind of like, I'm letting you see a lot of myself right now, but not all of it. Awesome. And so when um, when you shot this with limited resources, how did you, what was the shot setup? Were you shooting it on your phone? Um, where, did you have like a, a tripod setup or was it just kind of like a point and shoot um, type of deal? Like how, what was your process while you were uh, making this? Um, I used, a black magic camera mm -hmm. um, and the only lens I have for it actually is a 45 to 175 which means it's very zoomed in right. uh, and I don't have a tripod so I could only get it was it was pretty difficult to shoot um, I'm in a pretty small apartment so uh, for example like the shot of me putting on my sweater in the window the mm -hmm. camera was very far away yeah yeah it seems like it would just be kind of a few feet behind me it was very far away yeah and so um, going off of that just having it since it was you shooting what uh, one of the questions we have is how many takes did it get the cat to the bowl on cue um, that was actually <laughs> the easiest shot. I mean, my oh. cat's in, in two shots, but that was the easier of the two because she is very food motivated. Okay, so yeah, all, yeah. all I had to do was walk with the little um, cup of her food mm -hmm. into the room and then back out. And that was, awesome. it was very easy. <laughs> well, that, that, that's usually the, the way to go, definitely with, uh, um, with, with animals for sure. Yeah. Um, from Facebook, we have a question that says, what inspired the aesthetic in her, in your film? Um, I lately have been very inspired by um, quietness and stillness in films. Mm -hmm. I feel like the quietness is kind of, it says a lot um, and shows it's easier to see like film visual techniques mm -hmm. when it's really quiet and there's kind of no distraction, I guess. Um, I've just always thought it was really interesting hearing uh, sounds 
in film not being overcome by music or anything. Um, my cat's making her appearance. I was gonna say, she's making her debut. She's uh, yeah. the stars right there. I'll bring her up. Um, but yeah, she's uh, the aesthetic of the film. Um, yeah, I guess just the stillness and quietness, especially being in quarantine and being alone, uh, I've really noticed it even more. Yeah. So as much as quarantine isn't fun, uh, I feel like for someone that likes stillness and quietness, it's not terrible. It's not the worst thing. Yeah, I can relate to that for sure. So last final question, um, what are, what's, what's your next project? What, is there something you've been working on while in quarantine? Is there anything that you, you know, had to postpone until after quarantine? Um, I guess what's next? What's next for you? Um, I guess I don't really have anything planned. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of shooting on Super 8. Uh, I'm, I've been loving doing that. I have some more roles that I want to get developed. Um, but those are kind of just, you know, filming my friends or filming random things around that I've been doing, but nothing super pressing at the moment. Awesome. Well, uh, I mean, the Super 8, th those are always fun. I, I myself have a couple Super 8s and a 16 millimeter. So those, I mean, the, the image capture on those are, is not what you really see, you know, today without it being a filter or something but i just want to thank you again for allowing us to show your film and for coming in and, and you know saying a few words and answering some questions so thank you so much abby uh for for you know tuning in with us thank you it's been a pleasure Fantastic. So now we're going to roll over to um, an, our next filmmaker eric uh this this next particular film was uh definitely not what i expected when i when i you know saw it for the first time or was looking into it. So um, Eric, thank you so much for, for joining us and being a part of this uh, virtual film cafe. Uh, I'd love for you to just kind of give a little bit of background on yourself and of this uh, short film that you have for us today. Sure. So um, my name is Eric McGuinn. I'm a cinematographer and director from Vermilion, Ohio. Uh, I just recently graduated with my BFA from Cleveland State School of Film and Media Arts. And uh, I don't know, over, over quarantine, we were kind of looking for something to do and we came across this competition that Cinema 5D was hosting mm -hmm. called the Board at Home Film Competition. So it had like, there were a few parameters um, outlined you know, by the requirements of the competition being that the film had to be a minute long and uh, it had to deal in some way with the quarantine situation. So <laughs> we kind of conceived this idea to do something almost reminiscent of like a modern Geico commercial. So yeah, that's that's quick. exactly what I was going to say. It definitely seems like that's where, you know, the, the inspiration kind of came from, or the thought process kind of came from, because that's that's exactly what I was thinking when, um, when I saw it for the first time, especially with it being quick and very, you know, uh, just the, the lines and the moments were just kind of really on point. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad that came through, because that was, that was like a, a major inspiration for it. But... Um, yeah, so we, we submitted it to this competition and uh, we ended up tying for fourth place with a few other submissions out of like 250 international awesome. submissions. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's fun. Awesome. Yeah, so I, I definitely want um, want everybody to see this and to check it out. So we'll get right into it. And then um, I, I definitely going to have some questions about it uh, after we see it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, let's roll it. Cinema 5D Board at Home Film Competition is sponsored by Panasonic, Black Magic Design, MZ, and Music Vine. This quarantine sucks. This is the worst it's ever been. I don't know, man. Think about the Spanish flu. It could be worse. This quarantine sucks. This surely is the end of days. I reckon they must have had it pretty bad during the Black Plague. Could be worse. Yep. Oi! This quarantine sure is foul! This is the worst it's ever been! Just imagine if you were involved in one of those prehistoric plagues! Could be worse. Yep! Ugh. 
Ugh. Ugh. Yep. I think you're muted. I can't hear you. Mute myself. Cool. Uh, yeah. Every time I, that's, that was something that caught me so off guard the first time I watched it. Um, because, you know, obviously saw how short it was. And so I'm like, okay, let's, let's check this out. And, uh, yeah, that, that was definitely off the wall and, and very, very simple idea yet, um, very creative. So I, I kind of, um, what was your, I guess, what were your ideas going into it was it just you and and your co-star or was it just like how did that how did that come about uh so um the the girl i work with the producer who produces all of my films heather habermel uh she and i kind of decided to do this competition together um and then i reached out to jake who was the actor and we kind of spitballed a few a few ideas and ended on this one and uh yeah, it was a it was a very small crew. It was the three of us, and then my girlfriend ran camera for a couple of the shots. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it was. I think we did like a whole day's worth of shooting. Uh, it was pretty, you know, simple setups and whatnot. Just kind of waiting for the right weather conditions and whatnot. But, yeah. So, because we have one one of the questions was uh, was it green screen or on location? So I think you kind of just answered answered that. So uh, kind of talk us through those those different setups, you know, I mean, you have, you had multiple, you know, multiple different setups for that. Uh, so what were some of the locations that you ended up finding or if you just knew or how'd that go about? Yeah. So I had, I had an idea of where I wanted to film uh, each segment. So it was just kind of a matter of coordinating that over the course of the day, which ones we were going to hit at what point. Cause you'll notice the, uh, the modern day one and the black plague one are both in the evening. So it was, you know, we kind of decided which ones we wanted to be at nighttime and for what reason. And then it was just a matter of coordinating our movement to the other locations from there. So I think if I'm remembering correctly, we started with the uh, the Spanish flu one, which was, that's at a location across the street from my grandparents' house, which is like 10 minutes from where I live. <laughs> and then we went and did the uh, prehistoric one, which is close to my house. And then the other two in the evening so. so which one out of all those was uh this is another question which scene was your favorite to shoot um <laughs> i don't know probably the uh the caveman one i think was kind of fun <laughs> just because uh jake and i you know we're in the middle of the woods and we're wearing like these ridiculous costumes and everything so it's, yeah it's kind of fun. so um so yeah that i mean that that definitely was a a, a very fun film and and so what um you said you graduated. So what's, what's next for you? What are your plans? You have some, uh, did you have shorts or anything in the works pre, uh, pre COVID-19? Is there things coming up that you're looking forward to? So for like the past year, almost, we've been working on prepping and shooting my thesis project, uh, for CSU. Okay. We filmed about 90% of it before the, uh, coronavirus <laughs> outbreak started. So we're waiting, waiting for everything to die down. We have, I think we literally have two scenes left. It's like two and a half pages of material. So <laughs> we just have to, we're going to wait and shoot that once things calm down and then uh, see where things go with that project from there. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that, um, Eric. Thank you so much for, for stopping in and, and uh, talking with us and showing us your film. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. So uh, continuing on, we actually have a uh, another filmmaker, Conrad. Um, Conrad is a, a, a very well-known local filmmaker. Uh, and so we actually have a, a, a double feature with, with Conrad today. So we wanted to um, just uh, get your background, man. And, and uh, for both these films, we're just showing back to back. We want to kind of get your, your uh, background on both of them. These both were very two very different films um and and you know the setup for them were, was very different so i just wanted to uh give you a chance to give a little bit of background on yourself and uh for each of your films yeah well thanks for having me it's good to see you antonio it's uh, yeah, it's been yeah, a while. Too, man. <laughs> yeah it, it feels like it's been years since i've seen anyone you know right so right cool. this is great uh yeah so for those of you who don't know me i'm conrad farah i'm a local filmmaker uh, based out of avon 
And um, yeah, we know these two movies that we're going to be seeing from me, I made here at home this past month, the past two months, uh, in April and in March. And uh, this, the first one that we're seeing, I believe, is The Astral, mm -hmm. uh, which was shot on the device that I'm, I'm talking to you on right now, on my phone. Um, so I shot this entirely on my phone with my sister as the camera operator. Uh, she's a 17-year-old high school student who has no idea, you know, about anything <laughs> filmmaking, but she was doing her best. Uh, but it was great. It was really, really fun. And then the other one that we are going to see, which is called Party of Five, I shot with my brother, who is 19 and also has no idea. But that one was shot with an actual pro camera. Yeah. Uh, and they're both just kind of different, uh, different projects. They were both really fun to make. The, the first one, the Astro, was for a competition. It was for uh, the Roger Corman Challenge, which was right. to make a, a two-minute um, movie on your iPhone. And it could be about anything. And of course, uh, me being me, I overshot the whole thing, and uh, it ended up being a little bit longer. Um, but uh, but it was it was a blast. It was a blast to make, and uh, yeah, I hope people enjoy it. Yeah. So yeah, um, uh, I think that's definitely the filmmaker's curse is is always shooting more than than you you end up needing in the end. But but yeah, let's definitely um, let's check these these films out. I mean, I had a great time watching both of these. So let's uh, yeah, let's roll it. So for the past three nights, I believe to have experienced something called astral projecting, which is where a conscious part of my soul exits my body and travels freely at night. Um, it's starting to freak me out, <laughs> uh, so much so that I, I can't sleep at night. And um, so, so I think tonight I'm going to experiment with something. I think I'm going to try and experiment and I'm going to see if I can catch myself while I'm having one of these astral projections. And I just, uh, I just hope nothing scary happens.
What the f- <laughs> Awesome. So, so uh, first question um, that came to mind with that, because I know you've, you've worked with, you know, all forms of, uh, of, you know, cameras. What, what were some of the things that um, with shooting on an iPhone, um, what was, what was that like compared to, you know, shooting with a, you know, regular studio type camera? Um, I mean, honestly, it wasn't that much different. I mean, what was different to me was, you didn't get as, as much of a dynamic range and the perspective was obviously going to be different because it's a fixed lens on a phone. Right. Um, but honestly, I mean, I felt the same way. I mean, at the end of the day, what matters to me is just telling a good story. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know how to cut together a, a movie and I know how to tell a story. So that to me was the priority. Everything else just came second. Yeah. Um, and, and, and thankfully there's a, a cool app. Uh, actually I used a lot of apps to make this look the way that it did. I used a VHS app to make the VHS kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I used one called Filmic Pro and Filmic Pro is an app that lets you film in a very cinematic style. It makes you, it, it, you can film in like widescreen or like in 185 or whatever you want to do. Right. Uh, right. And it can, you can actually uh, adjust your exposure and all those kinds of things. So it was, it was actually really, really nice. What was a little bit tough, though, was teaching my sister how to operate uh, the phone using that tool. <laughs> right, right. Because uh, we had to do a lot of takes until we got it right. But it was, no, it was great. Yeah. So since, uh, this is a question um, from uh, Wayne, since the uh, Corman contest was for a two-minute film, um, and this is much longer, is, is there a shorter, is there a shorter two-minute cut that you ended up going, going with for yeah, that? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. 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 Um, it was painful, but yes, there is a two minute cut that we did end up submitting. Um, and I had to cut a lot of it out, you know, at first, cause I, I did, thankfully I did the, the movie early, um, early on in the competition. And I thought I'm not going to submit it to the competition. There's no way that I can cut out, you know, it's a right. seven minute movie. There's no way I can cut anything out. Right. Uh, it's, it, you know, but then a week went by and I'm like, well, you know what? I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be that precious about it. I'm just going to cut out a bunch of stuff. So I, I cut out literally, almost the entire movie. I mean, that whole first little act, you don't even see it in the one that yeah. I submitted. Um, but you know, but then there was like over 2000 submissions to that competition and only one winner. So I'm just yeah. like, you know, whatever. We had, we had a great time. And, right, you know, right. It turned out pretty good. So, yeah. That's all, that's all, yeah. I think that's one of the things that a lot of filmmakers can, um, can relate to, especially ones that, you know, have a, a directing background and, and, you know, and play different, have different hats. Um, so what, uh, last question before we get into the the next film. What where did this story idea come from? Was it something specific, or was it just something that you were just like, "Hey, this would be an interesting concept. Let's see if we can do it." Sure, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, well, I always liked the subject matter of astral projection. I thought it was always so interesting. And then one day, I was looking up different video effects on YouTube, like tutorials on how to do video effects on yeah. like After Effects and things like that. And there was one about like out of body effect. And I'm just like, oh, how cool is that? Um, so then I, I started doing some tests and trying it out. And I'm like, I should make this into a little short film. Yeah. We're in quarantine, I have no one else. Right, I just do it right. by myself, you know, what's, what's the harm? And uh, that's honestly kind of what, you know, how the idea began. Right. Well, uh, you know, thank God for YouTube, because there are so many things that help, you know, self-taught type of things that are out there on the Internet now. So um, with that, let's let's roll right into your next film, uh, Party of Five. Let's definitely check this one out. Right, let's do it. She is just a girl, the quarantine is over, everything is back to normal, and it's gonna be a normal date. Nothing to worry about. She's here. Hi, 
Hey, Betty, it's good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you, too. Why are you going to invite me in or what? Yeah, come on in. <laughs> oh, my gosh, Will. Did you cook for me? This looks delicious. I sure did. A beautiful girl deserves a beautiful meal. Do you ever get offended by what people say about us? I don't know. What do you mean by that? Well, everyone says that we look alike. What? How was that? Yeah. Well, I, I thought it'd be kind of nice to invite a couple more friends over. Are you serious? One second. Howdy. Oh, you made it. Come on in. Here's Johnny. Howdy. Hi, Johnny. Um, it's so good of you to join us on our date. Say, Betty, I'm confused. I thought we was going on a date. What? Oh, my. Wait, wait. You thought Betty brought you to my house for a date with you? Well, I thought it was a strange place for it, but sweet, sweet Betty here sure is unpredictable. So I say, why not? Now, who is that? Um, oh my gosh, um, one second. I don't believe this. Oh, calm down, Will. Last two short, partner. You gotta be enjoying this time with friends. We are not friends. And why are you carrying that lizard? That's weird. This is my Bubba Cupcake. He goes everywhere I go. <laughs> Guys, these are my friends, Leah and Leo. Hey guys, thanks for having us. You're all looking mighty handsome today. Oh honey, I was just gonna say that. Everyone at this table is so incredibly sexy. I'm Leah, by the way. So what do y'all do for a living? Well, I'm an editor. I uh, work for this company based out of Cleveland, Ohio called Conrad Studios. Oh, are they any good? No, not really. But they're not afraid of challenges, I'll give them that. One time, I had to edit this director to make it seem like he was all the characters in his film. Well, that guy sounds like a big douche. Yeah, but I love his spirit. Oh, geez, Leo, it sounds like you're in love with him. Betty, do you have any more wine? Of course, dear. Well, so this is how the night's gonna go. What's the matter there, Will? Oh, don't mind him. He's just upset that Betty and I was on a date. Are you crazy? No, 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 no. This was supposed to be a romantic candlelit dinner between my girlfriend and I, whom I haven't seen in months. It was supposed to be special for me and her, and now all you people are here. Oh, relax, Will. It sounds like you need more wine. Yeah, that won't help. It works for me. Honey, we're having a nice time among friends. We'll have plenty of dates ahead of us. Betty, can I come to those too? Yeah, of course. You know what? I'm not gonna pay mind to anything at all. I am just gonna enjoy my dinner because today is a great day. So that's, that's all I'm gonna do. That's all I'm gonna do. Well, this is awkward. You uh, better slow down there, honey. Uh, we're gonna get drunk pretty quick. Oh, babe, I've been drunk since we got here. Oh, she's kidding, obviously. <laughs> right, honey? Leo, I just, I just need to tell you something. What? I've been cheating on you. What? When? For the past few months. But we were in quarantine. Doggy, this ain't good. Are, are you serious? You fucking bitch! Um, why don't we change the subject?
Betty, if we're telling secrets, I'm in love with you. Is he choking? Will, are you okay? Oh my God! Somebody help the poor man! You go help him. How? What do you mean, how? But we're all the same person! Will, please live! Don't die on me! You got this, Will! 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 Holy shit! You're a dude! I think it's time I leave this party. Well, I think it's time I go back to quarantine. Fantastic job, Conrad. Um, I, you know, it's it's always been amazing um, just the things you're able to come up with, so especially in that realm of the uh, 48 hours. So what, um, I guess kind of talk about that. So that was a com competition for, uh, I said 48 hour, was that uh, Cleveland based or was that, um, so yeah, was that Cleveland based or was that outside of Cleveland? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, uh, no, it was it was like a worldwide thing. It wasn't like mm -hmm. a competition, but it was like an event hosted by the the Cleveland Forty Hour, or I'm sorry, by the the Forty Hour Film Project in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they were they were basically asking filmmakers, "Hey, make a movie in forty eight hours, and here's the requirements." Uh, and the requirements for for this particular um, event was use two famous movie lines from from a certain list. So yeah. I picked my two movie lines, and I said, "Okay, I'm going to write." Uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a funny script. And, uh, but it's interesting because the script that I wrote, I didn't put any thought into it whatsoever. <laughs> I remember waking up Saturday thinking, oh shoot, I forgot I signed up for that contest because I got an email saying, I hope, you know, hope your films are getting ready. And I woke up Saturday morning, I was still in bed and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to write something. Whatever comes to my mind immediately, I'm just going to write. And I wrote it on my phone, on the whole movie. I wrote it on my phone, <laughs> the whole entire thing. And then I'm like, okay, I guess I'm doing this. And then I asked, you know, I, I was like, I, you know, ask my brothers, hey, can you help me film this? Because um, I, I, I don't know if I could pull it off by myself. Uh, mm -hmm. And and thankfully, he was available that evening. And, uh, you know, and then we just shot it uh, in a couple of hours. And I edited it on Sunday and, and, and I finished it. So it was fun. It was great. So biggest thing um, seeing in the questions is, uh, um, so your, your brother helped with the shooting part of it, right? Yeah. So then that means that over the course of shooting, you completely shaved your whole, your whole get up <laughs> had different, different looks, different yeah. looks throughout that whole time. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest with you, that was the hardest part because I had a pretty <laughs> thick beard and then I knew that the, the beard was going to progressively go down as the characters kept interchanging. Um, so the first time that I had uh, shaved down, it was between the main character and like the cowboy guy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, man, that took like an hour for me to like kind of shave that down. And then by the time I was Leah, the last character, I was just like in a whole different universe. Right. Like I was totally in character. So yeah, that was a big sacrifice that I, that I had to make for this project was my beard. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think a lot of um, filmmakers can relate to that that whole using yourself for multiple characters. I know I've done that in the past for, you know, or like, you know, for, for projects when you just have a limited amount and you got to reuse yeah. people for characters. And so I think that was a very uh, fun and, and entertaining way to do that almost uh, bluntly. Cause you know, at the end they say, Oh, we're all the same person. Um, sure. So I think that uh, that was, that was really fun to uh yeah. kind of see that you know play out play out on screen so we have a uh, we had a follow-up question about from wayne about the uh astral um is there going to be a posting uh, are you going to be uh posting the two-minute version anywhere that people can see it because you know it seems like people would like to see the sure. uh, you know what that two-minute version boiled down to it and yeah that up that's a, that's that's good. Yeah, I um I, I it's on Instagram. I posted on Instagram, but I, I don't believe I posted it on Facebook. On Facebook, I just posted on on the studio page, my studio page. I posted mm -hmm. like the full thing, but I, I do think that we we will be releasing the two minute version publicly, like on like YouTube and Facebook and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, um, another another question we have uh, from Kathy. She's she's asking um, 
she said both films are very fun and entertain entertaining you have uh, you've got the talent are you planning and i i hope i know the answer to this question but uh are you planning to stay in cleveland or are you thinking about heading to california or georgia to further your career um that's a great question kathy uh that's a very good question uh because i've been I've, I've been thinking a lot about this actually and I, and I haven't really like vocalized it anywhere so of course now in front of like however many people I, I might actually say what I intend to do but I, I, I do plan to move I don't know when um, but I do plan to move and I it's not going to be Atlanta and it's not going to be California uh, but I'm thinking that it's going to be somewhere down in the Austin area but okay. that's that's still like a very you know I don't I don't quite know yet I'm still trying to figure out what the career move is going to be for me Mm -hmm. um, I know that we have a lot of things that we're going to be doing in Cleveland, um, but after those things are done, I, I, I might be stepping away and, and, yeah. and going somewhere and else. Of, just yeah, and one of those things I know, uh, and this will be the last, the last question, is just that um, I know you have a, a film that was set to release, I believe, um, you know, early this year with uh, uh, Storm of Stars, and, and that was something you had shot last year, or finished mm -hmm. uh, production um, with last year, and so where's where's that is that something that because i know last time we had you down at the the film cafe uh we actually got a sneak peek on the trailer and i know since then you've actually put the trailer up um um it's out there online uh yeah. so where's where's the progress with that and and yeah and what's uh yeah what's the next step on on that project yeah well first of all i can't wait to be back at uh, the music box because yeah. i miss it and it's going to be wonderful when it reopens yeah um and but the stars in the storms is like my baby right now it's like my feature film child you know that i've been wanting to do for so many years and, and i was lucky enough to, to be able to do it last year uh we shot in new york um you know for like a week or two weeks and then we shot a lot of it here in cleveland we shot cleveland for new york Mm -hmm. um if that makes sense and and it was it was it was wonderful and, and right now we're basically done with the movie we just don't really know what to do with it yet we're yeah. trying to to have a, a plan of attack because i'm an independent filmmaker I, I don't really have big names in the film but what i do know is that i have a great story and I have great actors right and I, I do believe we have an amazing film and it's a feature-length film uh but we're just trying to figure out which route we go with whether we're going to go with, with festivals which was what we were intending to do but sadly, all of them shut down because mm -hmm. of the, the situation right now. Right. Um, or, or we might try to, to find a distributor um, to, to release it on VOD, which is, is, is like a big move right now. A lot of um, right. uh, streamers are buying a lot of content because the studios aren't making films right now. Um, so that might be the way to go is we might, be, we might approach uh, one, you know, one of these distributors and, and have the film be you know, purchased and seen on uh, video on demand. Awesome. And so last question. Um, with uh, you know still so much of 2020 um, left, is there anything that you've had in the works or planning? I know you just you you just put out a film um, a few days ago, um, but is there anything that was in production pre uh, COVID nineteen yeah. or anything that you have planned for later in the year? Oh man, yeah, we had something kind of huge like in the middle of pre production. We had a TV series that we were doing right. um, that we were gonna you know end up releasing on Amazon. And uh, it was called Making It in Ohio, which was like a comedy sitcom style, uh, docu-style sitcom uh, about filmmakers trying to make it in Ohio. And it was gonna be who we had amazing, we have amazing screenwriters and amazing filmmakers attached to the project, but we had to put it on hold for obviously for safety reasons and right. you know, for regulations and everything. But that's, that's the biggest hit that, the, that me and my team took was, was not being able to start production on that because we were right on the cusp of, of starting. Uh, yeah. filming um which was which we would have been filming right now actually uh but right now we're just kind of keeping it uh low-key uh we have a short film that we're going to be producing we start filming saturday awesome. um so that's going to be really exciting because i haven't seen my team in, in months i feel like um so i'm yeah i'm super hyped up to, to get back onto that awesome well i i know uh, a lot of filmmakers definitely have that that same itch and uh with things starting to look like they're almost on the up um i know things will start opening up so thank you again conrad for yet again you know coming in and, and joining us on this film cafe um and you know we definitely look forward to all these projects that you have in the future and and you know to see what your your career holds man yeah thank you so much antonio this was an absolute blast thank yeah always a pleasure man all right, so finally, uh, thank you all guys for uh, guys and gals that are still hanging with us right now. We have our last uh, filmmaker. And uh, uh, this, this definitely was something that when it came across, I was, I was very uh, 
entertaining because I have, uh, you know, pets and, and, and such. And, and I, you know, have the same kind of situation here um, through this film. So Misha is, uh, is I think he's going to be joining us soon. There he is. Hey, how's it going, man? Hello, Antonio. Wait to ruin the ending, Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. So um, anyway, I, I just want to kind of get into just get into you. And I know a lot of people, uh, you know, know you in the film community. Uh, so why don't you just give us a little bit of background on, on yourself and, um, you know, really what kind of gave our, our film, you know, this this film what was some inspiration behind this film. Okay. Um, well, I am, my name is Misha. I go by Misha, I guess. Um, I'm Russian. I came to this country when I was 13 with a dream to be a filmmaker. Not really, but I went to college and I had to be a filmmaker. And um, now I live in Cleveland, five years doing this stuff. Uh, the movie we did was when we shot in Atlanta. I was in Atlanta for this quarantine to wait for this whole thing to blow over. And this, I'm a huge fan of movies with twists. I don't like movies when you're just like, here's a movie I made. Look at this movie. I want to have a twist. I want to have something in the end that kind of catches you. Um, so that's what we have with this movie. And it, it touches upon a whole domestic violence right now because like, I know there's a lot of people who locked in with the people who are, you know, domestic violence and stuff. So, right. yeah, I just, that's just a movie. Yeah. I guess I'll let you guys decide it if, uh, if it's any good. This is all shot on phone too. Because yeah, I never right. I've been on the phone since high school, so this is new for me. Awesome, yeah. Let, well, let's roll it because I definitely want to touch on that uh, for sure. So yeah, let's roll. Let's roll the film. Good morning, Atlanta. Today is April the fifth, and it is going to be a hot one. High in the eighties and low of seventy-five. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy today during day sixty-five of the quarantine during this global pandemic with no. Awesome. So, um, so yeah, right off the bat, man, I, I I'm interested in um, what you kind of said originally because obviously my my um, my takeaway from it was just the the twist at the end with with the animals. But um, when you when you said you know it was kind of a a look into you know people being stuck at home and you know potentially stuck at home in, in domestic um, abuse situations, what was was that something that you felt um you wanted to just make a point on with this film in a, in a in a different approach or what was what was the thought process on that the whole idea is um i do a lot of comedic movies as you know all my movies the most of the stuff i do i do dark comedy yeah. we talk about serious subject but we try to lighten it up by in, throwing comedy in there a little bit but it's like one of those things that you got you can kind of think about it but at the same time 
it's not just a typical like stuck at home with somebody movie. It's like there's a twist. So there's I don't know. It's just, you make people think about stuff like that without actually making them think about it. Right, know? right. So um, we have a question from BJ. He uh, he says, did you use any apps or attachments on the phone, and how um, did you edit it off off of your phone or just through uh, software? No, I just we use the phone. We use the Galaxy, and then we just threw on a tripod and I edited all on the Final Cut X. That's it. So what, um, with shooting on the phone, uh, compared to shooting on digital or like with a, an actual camera, what, were there any challenges or any things that you had to set up additionally with lights or was everything just pretty much, um, as is when you were shooting? No, it, it sucked. It was awful. <laughs> I hate shooting on phones, man. It's, it's like, I'm so used to shooting on cameras. I, I use right. five for everything. So like, I know how to use a GH5, but like, phones it's there's you don't have enough like i don't know it's it's tough i don't i just yeah. like it yeah it was it just it's a pain in the ass <laughs> so, yeah, i yeah, definitely i mean even even with you have all these new new additions with you know new iphones and, and all these new things that are coming out it just they try to make it to be as close to a you know an actual uh camera as it can be but you know still it, it doesn't have those those main tweaks that you need for it um so when you shot this you were so you said you were stuck in it you were in atlanta when the shutdown happened so you is that just where you kind of came up with this idea uh, yes yeah, so my parents live in charleston south carolina and my friend caitlin lives in atlanta so i came out to, to visit her for like a weekend and then go to help, help out my parents and stuff at home and it just kind of everything just stopped and i was like all right i'll just stay in atlanta so i stayed in atlanta for like a month and a half <laughs> writing, did music, did everything. I did a studio in a house, so I did a bunch of music, voiceover. Mm -hmm. I did a bunch of work from home. It was nice. So it was chill. Now I'm I'm back today. Actually, yesterday I got back. So. <laughs> Good. Nice. Well, I you know I know uh, as many um, people in the in the film the film world you know in, in Cleveland and and even outside of Cleveland you know you you got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, you know you have the the low life series. You have the low life band. You do you know music videos. You do the events. Uh, so what's what's really next for you, man? I mean, like I said, with Connor, we have a lot of, I still think we have a lot of 2020 left. Um, was there anything that you had planned uh, um, pre-COVID-19 or anything coming up, you know, in the, in the end of 2020? Yeah, we actually, uh, we got a producer, Dan Edwards, who's going to be helping us out with everything. We had the whole movie ready to go. Everybody's getting paid. The crew's ready. Location's locked in week before it's supposed to be shooting, this thing happened. So it's a movie about old girl punk rock band. So mm -hmm. it's, it's with a twist as usual, but right. it's not coming out. We're gonna be shooting as soon as this thing over. But in the meantime, we have a couple of videos come out. Have you ever seen that movie, uh, the show, the or video that we did is called uh, uh, The Worst Indie Filmmaker in the World? Yeah, 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 with Sean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sean, Sean Manos, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but, we went viral with that a little bit here and there. So we're doing a part two of that because there's a word in the street. There's a lot of filmmakers been acting up. And so we're going to be doing a part two of that from all the horror stories that actors and crew has on set. <laughs> we call the worst uh, filmmaker part two. So that's well, you. Uh, this week. So. <laughs> well, we'll definitely be looking out for that, man. I really appreciate you, you taking the time to, you know, uh, come out and, and share your film and give a little background on you and, and then, you know, allow us to, to, you know, know what to look out for, you know, at the end of, uh, you know, coming up in 2020. So I really appreciate it, man, for you coming out. You, yeah. All right, guys. So um, that's, that'll do it for our virtual uh, film cafe. Again, really thank you all for staying with us. And um, again, great shout out, a uh, huge shout out to uh, the Greater Cleveland Film Commission and um, Evan Miller for taking out of the time to uh, come and talk with us today. I really, uh, you know, the film commission has been doing a lot to to try to keep everybody, you know, afloat during this time. Um, really, 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 really look to support them, as well as the uh, music box opening up June 18th, Thursday, June 18th, uh, with uh, Bobby DeBazio. Again, great venue, local venue. Uh, really, 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 really appreciate the support with you guys. Um, and, uh, you know, Emerge Micro Cinema, be sure to check them out. And uh, thank you again to our sponsor, Cleveland, Cleveland State Film, um, School of Film and Media Arts. So thank you guys so much. We'll definitely keep you posted on when the next uh, in-studio in film cafe will be. But until then, everybody, please be safe. 
And uh, yeah, see you guys around.